Hello there. I've had several large projects I've been working on, but this little while I've been so busy that I was afraid I can't put anything out. Well, it may not be a video on China, or any of the other dozen things I've wanted to put out, but it's at least something. I hope you forgive me for being so busy and are okay with an old school debunking video for now. So, this video has been recommended to me for years on YouTube and I've never watched it. The reason, because it's a British conservative member of the European Parliament, I can guess at what he's gonna say. Capitalism, freedom, human nature, Cuba, or the USSR, or Vietnam, etc. Bad. Fascism is definitely a form of socialism, guys, and if we're lucky, an Orwell quote or two. Let's see how right I am. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, who said this? I'm a socialist, and a very different kind of socialist from your rich friend, Count Reventlow. It was 1930, and the speaker was a rising German politician called Adolf Hitler. Ah, and we're off. Immediately, a quote from Hitler, the, um, well-known socialist. This is a frequent mistake that those on the right make, and this dude looks too educated to unintentionally be making that mistake. Nonetheless, it's interesting how he doesn't quote the whole passage, which goes, I am a socialist, and a very different kind of socialist from your rich friend Count Reventlow. What you understand by socialism is nothing more than Marxism. Aha! So the very quote itself differentiates Hitler's supposed socialism from Marxism. He's already built himself on top of a fallacy. How lovely. Let's go on. In 1930, the contention that fascism had emerged out of socialism was accepted across the board. It was an observed historical fact. <coughs> Fascists marched under red banners on May Day. Their leaders believed in high tariffs, in workers' control of factories, in a moment, in uh, common production of and distribution and, uh, 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 and exchange, as we just heard. Go on. Oh lord, high tariffs. High tariffs aren't socialism. The Bahamas, Pakistan, Iran, South Korea, and dozens more have relatively high tariffs. Does that make them socialist? Furthermore, he goes on to say that Nazis believed in worker control of factories. Where? Honestly, name a factor to substantiate your argument. The simplest cursory glance at any serious history of Germany at that time proves you dead wrong. This, essentially, is a lie. Hmm, now why would a conservative lie to what appears to be highly impressionable teenagers? Hmm. Anywho, then he mumbles about common production and exchange without really qualifying what he meant. Somehow, he keeps a smug look on his rat-adjacent face without having delivered anything substantial. Seems he thinks that Hitler quote at the beginning was a strong start. Hitler wasn't a socialist, and neither was the German economy at the time socialist. Academics have proven this point time and time again, and Democratic Socialist 01 has a great video on it too, for those interested. Already with Mo fascism is socialism, if that really was the case, why are you conservatives tripping over yourselves on your way to supporting fascists, while imprisoning and killing socialists and communists? He then mentions red banners and mayday parades as if that's as strong an argument as he thinks he's making it out to be. Continuing in trend, we'll see a lot more of from this guy, he obfuscates the truth intentionally and tucks away all context so that his argument seems sound. His argument isn't sound, of course, and that's why he has to resort to these silly games. The reason fascists appropriated leftist symbols was because workers' parties were incredibly popular, and they knew they had to at least pretend to appeal to workers if they wanted any chance of power. The marching under a red banner thing is a meme because, well, so do Canadians and Turks and Tunisians. Red isn't exclusive to socialists, and the Nazi flag colors were specifically used because they evoked the flag of the German Empire. Nice try, though. Will the other speaker agree that the first inmates of the concentration camps yeah. in Nazi Germany were communists and socialists? Buddy here knows what's up. The first victims, unsurprisingly, were Marxists. Mm, let's see how he twists this. Badly slapped together arguments about supposed leftist infighting, perhaps? Yeah, and there was a reason why... <laughs> and further patience, as we say, where I work. It is absolutely true that socialists of the national and Leninist varieties were bitterly opposed. They were fishing in the same pool. They were competing for the same kind of voter. Oh boy, turns out I'm right, hooray. These types are so predictable. Shame they never pick up a book. The one kind of person that neither brand of socialist had any time for was the classical liberal, what they called the decadent Anglo-Saxon bourgeois capitalist. Uh-huh, the Nazis had no time for the classical liberal, the decadent bourgeois capitalist, which is entirely a redundant phrase, by the way. 
Is that why the Nazis warmly accepted the support of every industrialist and capitalist, both domestic and international, that came their way? Krupp and Ford didn't exist, did they? Is that why the Nazis dissolved labor unions and prevented workers from striking? Is that why they returned record profits to those same capitalists? Is that why the concept of privatization was literally coined to describe Germany at the time? You absolute imbecile. You want to know why they ignored them? Because they were already on the same side. Hard to ignore someone sitting at the same table as you. Why? Because theirs was an ideology that elevated coercion over freedom. Because theirs was an ideology that elevated coercion over freedom. Because capitalism never does that, right? Slaves just consented to work on cotton plantations, and the Native Americans just consented to being genocided off the face of the earth, because liberal capitalism is all rainbows and sunshine. Children working away making sneakers for cents on the hour in Bangladesh are in no way coerced, right? This is the poverty of liberalism and the conservative mindset, the idea that coercion can only be at the end of a gun. They never consider economic coercion, which is the grease that keeps capitalism rolling along. Now, why do I begin with this? Godwin's Law, high stake opening. <laughs> Two reasons. First of all, as a corrective, as a corrective to the self-righteousness that we've already started hearing, where people who claim to be socialists then start claiming uh, credit for everything from uh, the extension of the franchise to the extension of universal education. But that is an objective fact. The only reason child labor was abolished, the workday shortened, maternity leave instituted, universal education developed, and practically everything else was because of the bloody struggles of leftists all around the world. Hell, the only reason European social democracy became a thing was because there was this massive power, the Soviet Union, right next door that provided free, high-quality education at all levels, full employment, full women's rights, housing, comprehensive and free healthcare, and so much more. Denying this is denying history, which his types are rather fond of doing. But my real point is this one. Socialism rests on compulsion. Its defining ethic is not equality, but coercion. Uh, this bullshit again. That point remains to be proven, but you assume capitalism doesn't? Teachers in the US working three jobs in order to not starve are not coerced in any way? This is just bullshit at this point. Socialism and capitalism are matrices. They are economic systems within which people can be generous or greedy. They can be selfish or altruistic. Human nature comes whether from our genes or from our maker. It isn't something that's created by an economic system. Uh, the human nature nonsense. I'll paraphrase the answer Govara gave in an interview once. You say it's human nature. A child gets one toy and wants two. He gets two toys and gets four. This is human nature. What of the empathy you feel for the starving and the downtrodden? That is human nature too, no? Aside from his complete lack of a scientific understanding of people's motivations, it is proven beyond doubt that human beings have been shaped by their material conditions, both in the long term and in the short. Nature too. Kropotkin even wrote a book about it. We lived in communal and cooperative setups for hundreds of thousands of years, developing a natural human inclination for some importance on the group rather than just the individual. Secondly, the situations you are in in life can shape you in various ways and affect your actions too. A thief who stole some bread wasn't born a thief. They did it out of necessity. Similarly, your sad attacks on socialism are in defense of the system that you and the class you support upholds. Everything has its roots in the material conditions that surround it. But what's unique about socialism is the readiness of the state to deploy coercive force. Do I really need to comment on this? What's going on in the US right now with literal unmarked vans picking up people on the street, black site prisons, imprisonments without chart? Do I really need to tell this dude to read the new Jim Crow? As for historically, how fucking blind do you have to be to not see how every single capitalist state has unleashed the most horrific forms of state repression in defense of profits? Thatcher in Britain, the US bombing of its own citizens in Philadelphia in 1985, the murder of Fred Hampton, the massacre of countless hundreds of thousands in Indonesia for just the suspicion of being communists, Pinochet's reign of terror, I, I can go on and on. Read The Triumph of Evil by Austin Murphy to get a glimpse of how kindly capitalist states deal with opposition. Now we've evolved a great vocabulary to describe this. We talk about things like asking people to pay a bit more tax, right? See what happens if they choose not to. Behind all that polite sounding, asking them to pay their share to contribute, is the threat of prison. Not for the rich, though. Curious how that is. Also, again, this guy doesn't know what socialism is. Why don't any of them know what socialism is? A little more tax, please, isn't fucking socialism. Just read a book, please. The idea that, as we just heard from Katie, that those of us on this side are in favor of dog-eat-dog. Dog. If by dog-eat-dog dog, you mean 
the desire for material improvement. That is a fundamental in human nature under all systems. You had it under the communist regimes, you had it under feudal regimes. But what is unique about capitalism is that it harnessed that ambition to a socially useful end. He's badly delivering the argument, capitalism causes innovation, you dumb commies. Tell that to parallel development of the same exact technology by two competing firms, causing twice as much waste of resources, manpower, and everything else. Capitalism also innovated the beautiful concept of planned obsolescence, where things should break before the natural end of its usefulness so that people go out and buy more. Or say it even to the pharmaceutical companies, I would rather make acne cream instead of malaria medication because one is profitable and one is not. Under every other system devised by human intelligence, a group of people sat on top and the way to get rich was to suck up to those in power, whether they were kings or bishops or commissars. Whoa, he's a bootlicker supreme. Literally talking about sucking something or other to do with those in power. Hey, we don't king shame here, so you do you. Just don't pretend it's profound political theory. Also, again, socialism isn't some group at the top having power either. Isn't it painful to be wrong all the time? We, uniquely, in this country, and we then exported it, came up with a system where you satisfied your ambition by serving the rest of your fellow citizens under the law. Oh yes, by dumping toxic waste products into rivers and generating massive amounts of harmful contaminants into the environment, and developing sneaky advertising mechanisms to lie to people and nip at their insecurities so you could get another sale or two, and colonialism and imperialism systematically impoverishing already poor countries through predatory loans and then forced restructuring and austerity measures, and the military invasion and occupation of sovereign nations in order to forcefully extract resources and get access to markets when other methods failed in doing so, and coup after coup after coup of democratically elected leaders that don't agree with NATO foreign policy. By the way, he said we came up with and then exported this supposedly great system. Who exactly? The British Empire? Ah, yes, the glorious British Empire that ravished and raped half the planet, leaving destruction and death wherever it went. My own country was occupied by the British, and the Brits, being the jolly people of AR, gassed ethnic minorities and interfered in our politics, you know, as you do, until we finally kicked them out. Kindly, fuck you, and fuck your shitty empire. Read Shashi Tharoor's book, Inglorious Empire, and how great this empire truly was. We channel that desire for self-improvement in a socially productive way. And that's why socialist countries are not just less wealthy than capitalist ones, but less free. Wrong on both accounts. For equal levels of economic development, socialist countries on all categories manage to provide a higher quality of life to their citizens than in equivalent capitalist countries. But you're not honest, are you? So you compare Cuba, a small island nation that has been embargoed for the past six decades, to the largest economic power humanity has seen, the US. Or you compare Vietnam to France, or the DPRK to Britain, and on and on. I made a video going into detail about how socialism provides a better quality of life. It's linked down in the description. Go check it out. As for freedom, well, freedom needs to be defined. In capitalist countries, people aren't free from starvation, homelessness, ignorance from lack of education, and on and on. Real, tangible things, not abstract freedoms that mean little more than low taxes and preferential treatment for massive multinational companies to people like you. That's the categorical difference between East Germany and West Germany. The categorical difference between East and West Germany was that West Germany had money poured into it for its entire existence to promote this better image facade. It was three times larger than the East, had faced far less destruction in the war, amongst other very questionable things like immediate rearmament and the rehabilitation of thousands of Nazi functionaries, many of which went on to become part of the West German government, NATO, and many other quote-unquote free institutions. The discussion on East Germany is so thoroughly poisoned because those who are against it are never honest enough to present the full context. If you'd like that, read the book Stasi State or Socialist Paradise by Bruni de la Motte and John Green between North Korea and South Korea. Again, being disingenuous. The differences have concrete reasons that he conveniently doesn't mention. He doesn't mention how the South had US money poured into it too. Nor does he mention that for the first three decades of the separated countries, the DPRK had a higher level of economic development than the South. He also doesn't mention how more munitions of bombs were dropped on the DPRK than all of Europe during World War II, destroying all, and I mean all, of the DPRK's industrial capacity, as well as rendering the vast majority of arable land essentially poisoned and unable to grow anything. Or how after the illegal dissolution of the USSR, the DPRK lost their largest trading partner, and with it, a lot of their ability to not only grow, but also get certain necessary goods that couldn't immediately be produced in the DPRK. 
Add on top of that the non-stop sanctions that have plagued the DPRK for 30 years, which are intentionally put in place in order to impoverish the country. This is the hypocrisy of capitalism. A country is developing in a way we don't like, and is doing fairly well actually. Let's diplomatically isolate them and restrict trade with them to such a point they can't even import pencils or antibiotics, and on top of that, let's sanction them endlessly, constantly threaten them with military invasion or nuclear destruction, internationally vilify them, and try our very best to make life as hard as possible for the citizens of that country. After that's all done, they point rabid fingers at how poor and horrible everything is in that country, as if they didn't intend to and succeed in doing that in the first place. For a detailed dive into the DPRK, read Patriots, Traitors, and Empires by Stephen Gowans. It's not just that socialism doesn't work in the sense that it fails to provide material advance. It actually does, again, on all fronts. Healthcare, housing, employment, education, infant mortality, life expectancy, caloric intake, women's rights, and so much more are all better in socialist countries at equal levels of development. That's all with the diplomatic isolation, sanctioning, constant threat of war, international vilification, and on and on. It doesn't work in that it takes away human dignity and civil rights, above all, our freedom to make choices as autonomous individuals. Yes, sir. Black people are shot on the street with no charge, no jury, and no trial. How can you in all honesty tell me capitalism allows for human dignity? Belgium used to exhibit black people in zoos until the late 50s, the same time period the socialist USSR was conquering the cosmos for all of humanity, yet one was part of the free and humane West, while the other was the oriental and despotic East. Again, those children working for cents on the hour making that suit that he's wearing surely aren't experiencing the dignity given to them by capitalism. How is it freedom to not have your daily bread, to not be able to go to a reasonable school, to not have any opportunities to develop yourself as a young person or even as an adult who well. wants to work <coughs> but who has not been given? Again, someone with sense. Put that guy on the status instead, Jesus. Sure. I mean, I, let's leave aside whether you mean positive or negative freedom. If you want those opportunities, if you want decent schools, if you want a rise in living standards, would you go to North Korea or South Korea? Moving the goalposts. How nice. First, it was capitalism provides freedom. Then it degenerated into positive and negative freedoms. Which is it then, hmm? Then he continues to rehash the stupid nonsense about comparing countries at wildly different economic levels and saying, hmm, do you want to go to the one that's richer or poorer? As if that argument isn't missing about three tons of nuance. By the way, education in the DPRK is actually pretty good, and so is healthcare, in spite of the destructive desires of capitalist powers like the US trying to crush it at every turn. The World Health Organization even praised their healthcare system as a model for developing countries, along with Cuba's. Karl Marx, who of course invented the thing, we, 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 let's not gloss over that fact. Karl Marx thought that as time went by, it would become more liberal, that he could take the constraints off that people wouldn't need to be told what to do. And like every other prediction that Karl Marx made, that was the opposite of the truth. You know, it's extraordinary. I have no idea what he's trying to argue here, and having dealt with enough of these types myself, I know for a fact he hasn't read Marx, so he's just talking out of his ass. Marx didn't invent socialism, he only elaborated theory on a specific form of socialism, scientific socialism, as opposed to utopian socialism of Europe at the time. Engels wrote a book on it, too. Check it out. Similarly, many indigenous societies and historic thinkers also had conceptions that could be termed socialist, from East Asia to North Africa. He needs to provide evidence for where Marx supposedly thought that things would get more liberal as time went on. Thing is, though, he wouldn't, because he's pulling this point out of his ass. Marxists uniquely claim that theirs is a scientific rather than a political doctrine. They claim that their truths are empirical. They're not just opinions. And yet every single forecast that Marx made. Marx thought if you took the constraints off, people wouldn't need to be told what to do. Ah, and conveniently, you expect yourself to be amongst those that do the telling, I suppose. His point about every prediction of Marx being wrong is not only absolutely bullshit, but also betrays a strange, almost religious pattern of thinking with this dude. Marx wasn't a prophet. He scientifically analyzed the development of capitalism and described how it worked. Many of the results of the analysis have proven to be true, for example, the falling rate of profit, while others not as much. For example, revolutions have predominantly erupted in semi-agrarian nations, rather than highly industrialized core countries. The Marx was wrong argument usually bundles together into a set of a dozen or so statements that are all equally incorrect, but for some reason are repeated ad nauseum. An interesting work that deals with these arguments, for example, the Marxism is a utopian one, or that Marxism is deterministic, is outdated, etc., etc., is Terry Eagleton's book titled Why Marx Was Right. Give it a read. 
Conveniently, though, this guy doesn't mention any of the things that Marx got wrong. He did get things wrong, and our friend here claims everything he predicted was wrong, but doesn't give any examples. Hmm, maybe he can't actually list any because he has never read Marx like every other right-wing hack? That there would be more and more unemployment under capitalism. That there'd be a smaller group of oligarchs and a larger group of proletarians. Every single one of them turned out to be the opposite of the truth. Oh lord, there isn't high unemployment, you say. The EU has 30 million unemployed. Turkey has over 10 million unemployed. The United States has tens of millions unemployed. Hell, my own country has a youth unemployment rate of over 25%. And those are just the official statistics. Independent researchers have shown how the US and many other countries consistently lie about their unemployment rate through clever math tricks that lower a number without actually improving the situation of the people of the US or anywhere else. His second point there isn't a small amount of owners, and the vast mass of humanity with nothing? Did he conveniently forget that six people own more than half of mankind? Did he forget that wealth inequality, even without a mind, is still rising? By the way, Marx never said there would be more and more unemployment. In fact, the opposite, that a consistent chunk of the population would be employed because capitalism requires a consistent workforce, unlike in feudal and ancient times. What he did argue was that capitalism necessitates a reserve army of labor, meaning a perpetually existing significant group of unemployed, in order to facilitate the lowering of wages and always providing the capitalists with an ever-eager workforce that will work for pennies so they don't starve. Ever wonder why every single capitalist country has unemployment? Usually quite significant, even, and numbering in the millions in some countries. This is the reason. This idea... Have you read Yes, of course I have. I, I, I have the pleasure... I had the pleasure, like a number of people here, of studying at an old university where we were obliged to read these things if we did a history degree. This is going to have to be my last one. He's lying, because so far he's shown zero understanding of Marx, like every other one of these types. Also, nice of him to touch on the bullshit meme that is, my universities are run by Marxists. Read the book Academic Repression by Parenti to get just a glimpse of how bullshit that talking point is. The only thing fully taught and supported in modern universities is, in clear Gramscian fashion, what further enforces the cultural hegemony of the ruling class. Um, there seems to be a lot of confusion on the side of Marxism about what actual system we're talking about. First of all, we were talking about social democracy in Britain as it was in the 60s and 70s. All right, so I fast forward through this bit, but basically what happened here is that this woman mentioned that he confuses numerous definitions of the left, social democracy, socialism, communism, even non-socialist ideologies like fascism, the right-wing shit. You know, the usual brain worms these types suffer from. Um, he fumbles and ignores her, essentially. Thank you. I want, to, I want to tackle this idea, because it runs through the debate, that somehow on this side we are more materialistic, greedier, less humane, that we have less by way of fellow feeling and sympathy than those on the other side. Except it is the truth. If you uphold capitalism, you must logically also uphold all that capitalism requires to function, which includes unemployment in the form of the reserve army of labor, imperialism, both economic and military, the illegal overthrow of sovereign nations with democratically elected leaders in order to secure resources and control their industries and markets, environmental destruction in pursuit of more and more profits, wealth inequality in magnitudes that would make the pharaohs blush, the forceful extraction of surplus value from workers, which is the core source of profit, unequal exchange and trade, which I made a video on, and on and on. I made several videos on the inbuilt negatives of capitalism before. Check them out. If you contrast socialist and capitalist economies, you see precious little evidence of that. But for what it's worth, I am a conservative politician. I spend a lot of my time with libertarians, conservatives, and free marketers of every stripe, I can tell you, hand on heart, I have never met anyone who derives more pleasure from a healthy bank balance than from listening to Beethoven, or playing with his children, or going for a walk in the country. You see, this is the problem with a non-materialistic analysis of things. Who cares if individually they are good people? Most people are. The logic of the system they uphold, though, no matter how well-intentioned and big-hearted as they may be, requires them to do a certain set of things lest they lose their privilege, power, or wealth. A capitalist who raises his workers' wages and shortens their working hours will end up with less profits. Less profits means less money and resources to reinvest into the circuit of capital, meaning less development or advertising or whatever else, which will end up always in the same result. They will lose to a far more fierce and shrewd businessman, who will repress wages as low as they can go, extend the workday as long as they can possibly get away with it, circumvent every law and regulation through either bribe or flagrant dismissal of the nation's justice system, and in the end be rewarded for this behavior with record profits. 
tax dodging, embezzlement, neglecting environmental protection laws, wage theft, I can go on. You see it time and time again. It isn't a moral argument Marxists make. It's a scientific one. Who cares what your intentions are? What the system demands of you cannot be circumvented through a big smile, some Beethoven, and a walk with your kids. But what is it that enables us to do those things? It's economic progress. If he truly cared about economic progress, he'd at least entertain the notion that maybe former socialisms had something, right? Seeing as the two fastest growing economies of the past hundred years, the USSR and China, were both led by communist parties who took hold of nations that started as feudal backwaters, where peasants used wooden plows and turned them into spacefaring superpowers so magnificently developed in such a short span of time that people still to this day unfairly compare them to the US and Britain, rather than nations that started off at similar levels of development before socialism, like India or Brazil. The fact that you have a dishwasher and don't have to spend all your time doing the washing by hand means you can go for that walk in the country. The fact that you've got a car and don't have to queue up at the tram station means you have more time to listen to Beethoven symphonies. These things aren't exclusive to an economic system, and interestingly, it was socialists that were interested in safe, reliable, and affordable public transportation, not capitalists. That's why the US has no public transport infrastructure of any kind, while China has built more rail and train tracks than the US and EU combined. Similarly, for all former socialist countries as well. The fact that you don't have to spend six weeks working just to feed your children means you can spend the weekend playing with them. Again, the reduction of the working day was a communist policy that people had to die for in order to get. It wasn't capitalism that granted it, quite the opposite actually. When capitalists were forced to shorten the working day, they exported misery abroad, so now children in Thailand and the Philippines have to slave away for 14 hours a day instead, all for the sake of profit. Capitalism doesn't make humane conditions. It results in incentives for the ruling class to break laws, fund death squads, bribe politicians, overthrow governments, all in order to maintain the lack of humanity at home for higher profits, or at least, if all else fails, export this misery abroad, again, for higher profits. The book Killing Hope by William Blum covers this topic beautifully. And where did those economic advances come from? From the system that unlocked the inventiveness of a creative people, that tapped into the unlimited potential of human innovation, and that raised our species to a standard of living that a couple of generations ago would have been unimaginable. Uh, nothing more than a shitty capitalism equals innovation, socialism no innovation argument that debunks itself before he can even finish his sentence. Like I mentioned earlier, completely redundant parallel development of the same technology by two or more firms is logical, is it? Wasting billions on advertising is innovation. Planned obsolescence is progress. How about the fact that barely 6% of the world population have university degrees, and possibly some of the greatest minds of humanity have been lost to the cotton plantation, the tea farm, or to all the stressors of systemic poverty that is built into capitalism? I made a video detailing how incorrect this argument is, and you can check that out if you're more interested. It was socialism that advocated for universal, free, and high-quality education, and managed to do it in Europe and elsewhere, but not in the capitalist paradise that is the US. Unlocking human potential and human creativity. The Soviet Union's dedication to high-quality education is the only reason the US even began to take education, particularly of women, seriously. If your idea of unlocking human potential is slaving away at an insurance company or a bank trying to convince the elderly and infirm to take predatory loans and insane premiums, well, that says it all, doesn't it? Now that has happened for about a billion people in the world, those of us who can afford the car, those of us who can afford the dishwashers. There are six billion people, I'm sorry, I haven't got any more time. There are six billion people who cannot afford the cars and the dishwashers. But they will. They will, as free exchange and specialization and comparative advantage run their course, raising people to a higher and higher standard of living. The vast majority of poverty alleviation and rise in the standards of living has occurred in the Communist Party-led People's Republic of China, not some quasi-liberal austerity-structured market economy like Greece, Portugal, or Senegal. Whatever you consider China's system to be, this dude isn't advocating for that, but is advocating for the usual neoliberal nonsense that they all do, the same thing that academic study after academic study have proven to not be true. Market liberalization, economic restructuring, and everything the IMF and World Bank recommended to poor third world countries has only further underdeveloped these countries, not improved them. The non-Marxist economist Ha Jun Chang has published book after book on this topic, of which I'll highlight particularly two. 
kicking away the latter, development strategy and historical perspectives, and Bad Samaritans, the guilty secret of rich nations and the threat to global prosperity. Check those two out. Not only this, but based on the evidence, socialist countries, at equal levels of development with capitalist examples, have, at every turn and every metric, provided a higher quality of life. I again refer you to my video titled, Socialism Gives a Better Quality of Life. Speaking of which, I should probably remake that video sometime. But no, he continues to omit all nuance and outright lie by comparing poor third world sanctioned countries like Cuba, Vietnam, and Burkina Faso to highly developed colonial powers like France, Britain, and the US. If capitalism were truly superior, they wouldn't need to keep lying like this. Unless we go down the road of Cuba or Zimbabwe or any other socialist country because this motion is that it doesn't work. Here he goes again, providing absolutely no context as to why these countries are poor in the first place. But no, actually informing his audience that, hmm, Cuba is relatively poor, but a big reason is, is a 60-year-long economic blockade by the world's largest industrial and military power might blunt his point somewhat. Also again, with the disingenuous comparisons, a far more fair comparison would be Cuba and Haiti, not Cuba and the United States. Sadly, again, that would blunt his shitty points even more, and he has so few of them to go around, so what can you do? He finishes off with claiming socialism doesn't work when it objectively did work for millions upon millions of people, providing education, housing, healthcare, and so much, while dealing with constant sabotage, international vilification, economic warfare, military aggression, and everything else you can imagine. Also, defeating fascism, that's a pretty big one. Don't make the mistake of judging socialism as a textbook theory, but judging capitalism by its necessarily imperfect outcomes. Judge like with like. In the real world, you find me a functioning socialist country that has delivered more than a free market alternative. I yet again refer you to the study mentioned earlier, Capitalism, Socialism, and the Physical Quality of Life by Sarah Seto and Waitskin, that shows that at every single instance, at equal levels of development, socialism provides a higher quality of life. If you don't feel like reading, then I refer you back to the video I made on socialism and quality of life. This guy has exactly what he wants to see right at his fingertips, yet I doubt he changed his mind. They're usually not that honest. What was it that Richard Overton argued for in his Arrow Against All Tyrants? Self-ownership. He began by saying, I own my mind, I own my body, and if I am free to trade the products of my own labor, then, without the intervention of prelates or princes, then I will be fulfilled and happy. These were proto-libertarians. Hmm, what about owning your workplace collectively, with all other workers? You libertarian types always love to talk about ownership and freedom, but suddenly get squeamish at the idea of workers running their own workplaces. Hmm, I wonder why. He finishes off with some crap praise of the British Empire, which, I mean, praising slavery and the systematic invasion and occupation of any and every piece of land, along with the subjugation of the indigenous population, seems to be just the sort of thing this guy's into. I've talked enough, I've recommended enough books, and frankly this nonsense gave me a headache. Why are they never creative with their criticisms? I'll finish this video off with a quote from Lenin. Mr. Tugan, you can substitute Mr. Hanan here if you'd like, repeats the old trick of the reactionaries, first to misinterpret socialism by making it out to be an absurdity, and then to triumphantly refute the absurdity. The puzzled reader may ask, how could a learned liberal professor have forgotten these elementary axioms familiar to anybody who has read any exposition of the views of socialism? The answer is simple. The personal qualities of present-day professors are such that we may find among them even exceptionally stupid people like Tugan. But the social status of professors in bourgeois society is such that only those are allowed to hold such posts who sell science to serve the interests of capital and agree to utter the most fatuous nonsense, the most unscrupulous drivel and twaddle against the socialists. The bourgeoisie will forgive the professors all this as long as they go on abolishing socialism. And that's it. I 